Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let everybody say praise the Lord. I had one of those um, looking for Elder Marcelli. I guess he didn't get in here yet. Saw him outside. Yeah, he, he got me on this blue frog. Uh, it's an energy drink of some kind. I am wired up. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> Sister, I'm going to have to ask you to sit down. <laughs> Yeah, please. Ushers. <laughs> we we tell, tell Brother Marcelli he wasn't teaching one minute and he already sat me down. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. Well, praise the Lord. Good morning. It's good to be with you today. And of course, in the main service, my wife is with me. Both the boys are out and about, tell you more about that later. I know you're seated and you're all comfortable, so just right where you're sitting, let's just go before the Lord in prayer, ask the Lord to speak to our hearts, to speak to our minds, and then I'll go directly into the lesson. I got about an hour and a half to squeeze into this 45 minutes, so uh, let's pray, shall we? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. We're so glad and thankful to be here in the house of God today. Uh, to feel your presence, to study your word, to, to come among your people, to fellowship, to enjoy the so many benefits and blessings that are provided to us as Christians, as people of God. We're thankful today that we are in the tower of your name, that name Jesus that's been applied to our lives through baptism has become a tower that the righteous run into and are safe. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, that your spirit flows through us like a refreshing river of living water. This is the day that you have made, and we will be glad and we will rejoice in this day. I pray, Lord, speak to our hearts and minds through teaching, and preaching, ministry of the word and spirit. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. And let everybody say, in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. All right. I want to um, go into this lesson today. Uh, I want to talk to you about the DNA of God's will, the DNA of God's will. Now, when you start talking about the will of God, um, you know, obviously it's a topic of mammoth proportions and weeks and many months. And I've been living for God for 25, 26 years preaching and still uh, aspects of the will of God, fine tuning that we're still learning. But I want to hit a few of the broad strokes and get right down to some things that I think will help us, uh, help us out. Romans chapter 8, verse number 28 is the key verse of Scripture. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Isn't that a fantastic Scripture? Everybody said amen. amen. It's a great verse. All things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. The promise or the blessing or the positive of the scripture is that all things work together for good. Now, that's quite encouraging, especially when you're going through uh, negative or discouraging or fearful circumstances and things are not working out. You can fall back and lean on a verse like this that says, somehow, some way, this is going to work out to my good. It's a magnificent verse. It's full of hope. It's full of uh, confidence. And, and really, it's full of assurance. It's one of those blessed assurance type verses. Whatever happens to me in my life, uh, it is guaranteed by Virtue of the very word of God itself, it is guaranteed to benefit me in some manner. In some way, it's going to be worked into the mix. When I think of this verse, it reminds me, and I don't know much about cooking. Uh, I only ever failed one single class in all of my entire years from elementary school through high school. I never failed any, any subject except one, and that was home ec. I found out I couldn't cook or sew. But... Um, we're, you're making a cake, and there's this stuff called vanilla extract. And it smells good, but it tastes terrible. <laughs> and it smelled so good, I just had to try a spoonful of it. Well, I learned quite quick. I'm thinking, why in the world would anybody put something that tastes so horrible into a cake that's supposed to taste so good? Until you find out that 
That ingredient all by itself may not be so good, but when you mix it in as part of the entire recipe, it all works together to make the desired product. And that's the way it is sometimes with these negative, discouraging, fearful events in life. By themselves, they're not very enjoyable, they don't taste very good, but when you mix it into the whole picture, it does work together. And ultimately, even if you cannot find or identify or figure out how, this is helping me here in this life. We do know that uh, it's all going to get better by and by. That we are living not just for this world, but for an eternal kingdom and for an eternal reward. And that ultimately, uh, if everything I go through strengthens me to live for God, then I'm going to benefit from it in the sweet by and by. Now, there are some great scriptures that continue to support and continue to build this idea of all things working together for good or these benefits of God. You know this one, Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Their righteousness is from me, saith the Lord. What a great verse of scripture uh, that tells us of God's working for us even when weapons are coming against us. He didn't say a weapon wouldn't be formed. He just said it would not prosper. It would not complete its uh, purpose or function. Romans 8, 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? Another great verse of scripture reminding us the many benefits of God. If God's actually on our side, if God is helping us, if God be with us, then the power behind us is greater than the problems and the trial in front of us. Um, and then Joseph. Joseph famously declared this truth that we're looking at right here. Uh, the setting was when his brethren came from Egypt. Joseph was now out of prison, second only unto Pharaoh. He's in charge of all the food. His brethren have come from Egypt uh, to Egypt to buy food from him. They realize who he is. He's in charge. And they suppose they are certainly all going to die. But in Genesis 50, 19 and 20, Joseph answers and says to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant it evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day and to save many people alive. So we look at these verses of scripture, all things working together for good. If God be for us, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And it is all telling us that, that there is this promise of God that all things are going to work together. That somehow, some way, even though we don't understand it, we don't have the insight and we may be fearful or upset or discouraged about it. Uh, don't, don't be discouraged because all this is going to work together to bring about a, a good end, to bring about an eventual victory. And of course, we could go on and on about the benefits and the blessings that the Lord has for his people. We're very familiar with all of his promises. One of my very favorite sermons that I like to preach traveling around the country is standing on the promises of God. And I found out that there are over 8,000 promises uh, in the Bible itself. And we're standing on those promises. But, but where I really want to go to apply this to our, our lesson today on the will of God is, is the secret. Because the, the blessings are many, the blessings are great, but there's a, there's a secret in that verse. There is a qualification or a condition involved if we're going to enter into this abundant life. Uh, there's something on our part. Watch the verse again. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. It doesn't just mean all things are going to work together for your good no matter what you do. All things are going to work together for good no matter how you act. It's not true. There's a condition, and it is you have to love God and be called according to His purpose. Living according to His purpose is fundamental to living the abundant life, complete with all the blessings. I think this is one place we maybe frustrate ourselves sometimes in the Pentecostal church, uh, we major on the blessings, we major on the miracles, we major on all the things God's going to do for us, and we have faith for them and encourage one another to receive them. 
when we forget sometimes that you have to qualify for much of what's in the Word of God. And I think what maybe confuses us is we forget that there is a difference between salvation and discipleship. Salvation is free. There's no pre-qualification. All you have to do is repent of your sins, come to the Lord uh, at Calvary's cross, let the blood flow, enter, identify with him at water baptism, filled with his spirit. You can come in whatever condition, come with whatever attitude, come out of whatever sin, living like the devil. You can come to the cross just as you are. With no pre-qualification, you can be saved and enter into. And salvation is free. But discipleship costs you something. Once you enter into discipleship, it's take up your cross. Deny yourself. And uh, count the cost, the Bible says. So we sometimes get confused between those things that come from the Lord to save our soul from uh, eternal damnation, which is free. It's unmerited favor. In other words, it's, it's uh, undeserved. We didn't do anything to deserve it. We don't do anything to get it. We don't do anything to qualify for it. But as soon as you are saved and you enter into discipleship, suddenly that entire uh, scenario changes and now everything is based on your actions and responses and decisions and how you live your life. And this is one of those verses. All things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. I want to, since this is a Bible lesson, uh, let's just look at it just a little deeper. The phrase according to his purpose. Um, the word according means agreeing with or being like-minded or allowing, accepting, or accommodating. And then the word purpose means a resolve, a will, as in your will or his will, a desire, a, the plan, the strategy, or the blueprint. So when we start putting these phrases together, we're talking about living in agreement with his plan. Living in agreement with his strategy in our life. Allowing his desire to become our desire. Accepting his will or accommodating. I thought this was an interesting language. Accommodating his will. Making room for it. Making it fit. Uh, allowing the will of God to mold itself to our life. Uh, making room for it in our life. And it's, you cannot make room for the will of God just on Sunday morning at church. You have to make room for the will of God all week long. Not my will, but thy will be done. Not my way, but your way. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. And if you want to truly live this abundant life, this, this life where all things somehow work around to benefit you at the end of the day, you have to be living according to the will of God. You have to be allowing his will to be working in your life. Um, let's go in a little deeper. Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Uh, there's a lot of teaching that could be done right there as you're talking about the reasonable service of God, living, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Both knowing and doing the will of God. Now, again, there's a lifetime of living in that phrase right there. Knowing the will of God and doing the will of God. It's not really as easy sometimes as you think to know the will of God. We can know the will of God in some broad strokes, and I'm going to talk about some of those broad strokes today. But fine-tuning that will of God, knowing the will of God in each and every particular circumstance. And then sometimes once we know the will of God, being able to do or perform the will of God is equally challenging. You may know what God wants, but maybe you don't want it. <laughs> maybe you're not, you have not come to that place of agreement with it or that place of peace with it. 
uh, or you may know to do the will of God, uh, but you just can't find the ability or the motivation or the faith inside of you to step out and make that step. So knowing it is one part and doing it is another. But our requirement, everybody say requirement. Our requirement. See, that's, again, it seemed like we've, I've watched the pendulum swing in Pentecost uh, from my youngest years in the church till now. When I, I remember being very young and, and, and church was, uh, you were always being warned of hell and, and, and of sin. And, and we were reminded that there is a price to pay and wage of sin is death. And it seemed like on the one hand, it wasn't quite as happy as it is today, but we lived with a fear of God. We live with a fear of being lost and we lived with a great respect and reverence for God. Well, we, the pendulum has swung over here. Now all we ever talk about is signs, wonders and miracles and blessings and God doing good stuff for everybody. And everybody gets blessed all the time every week. And we seem to have forgotten that there are some requirements. Uh, there is some things I must do. And there are some things that are on me. Uh, and one of them is to present my body a living sacrifice unto the Lord. To be holy. That's a requirement. That's not just a good idea. That's not just the church's uh, involvement policy to see who can sing in the choir. To be holy. If you're a member of this church without any title or any job description or any position, you're a, my mother used to call herself a pew on. She said, I'm just a pew on around here. I just sit out here in the pew. She says, I'm not up there with all the elite. <laughs> Mama's will tell you how it is, you know. She said, I'm just a pew on. Well, if you're just a pew on, being holy is a requirement. It's part of our responsibility, becoming acceptable to God, presenting ourselves to God in a way that he accepts us. And do not be worldly. That's part of the requirement of a Christian. And then it defines that a little bit. Do not be conformed to this world. That word conform means adapted to, fitting in with. Do not fit in. The Bible plainly tells us don't fit in. And it seemed like we spend so much time trying to fit in. Do not imitate. In other words, do not live your life after the pattern of. Do not imitate them. Do not act like them. Do not use their language, their lingo. Do not uh, follow their fads. Do not go uh, after the things they go after. In other words, we are, we are people of a different kingdom. We are living for a different purpose and a different cause. It's up to each one of us to prove or to verify, you might say, or to confirm what is the perfect will of God for our lives. You know, you have a responsibility as a Christian, the best I can tell from the word of God. You have a responsibility to, to be seeking and trying to determine, trying to figure out what is the will of God for my life. Now, again, the overall will of God, the general will of God, and then trying to find the will of God in every little circumstance. Um, I personally think before you take a job, you should pray whether it's the will of God or not. I think before you quit your job, you should pray whether it's the will of God or not. Amen. Just because you don't like it doesn't necessarily mean it's not God's will for you to be there. Um, I think before you move. One reason we are, uh, our family, we've been uh, about eight months now in what we're calling our Job season, a trial. We've been living in our RV now for about five months with our furniture and storage is because we have been trying to find the will of God for where we belong. I could go out and rent a house. I could have rented 10 by now. I could go throw the money down this afternoon and rent a house. I've been in, looking in Florida. I looked in Austin, Texas. I've been looking in different uh, cities here in Louisiana. And there's several options. Could have already just done it. But we've waited because we want to make sure when we make this decision that it is the will of God. Where do you want us to live? Where do you want us to be? And I think, I think sometimes we... The word that comes to mind is capriciously, we randomly, without much thought, we just make a lot of decisions and we just do them. We just hope God's going to bless what we're doing. But it's not what that scripture said, that he just bless whatever we do. It's as long as we're in agreement with his will. And we really, and, and you have to spend some time discerning and praying and listening. One of the reasons of coming to church, 
Coming to the house of God, coming to Bible lesson, coming to the church service is to hear the word of the Lord coming from the pulpit to see where is it confirming? Where is it instructing? Where is it pointing of what we should do? You can be right in the middle of a decision, right in the middle of a conversation about this or that and discussing certain things and then come to church and from the pulpit can come a phrase or a word, could be in a song, could be in a testimony, somebody that's not even preaching but gets up to say something and it hits right in the middle of where your discussion was and what you're thinking about and praying about and it becomes a word or a point of direction and and, uh, one prayer that I always pray is Lord give me eyes to see give me ears to hear give me a heart to understand Uh, we are not people who seek after a sign but we should be people who are very sensitive to signs in other words you don't set it up like fleecing God every single week You know, if they read this verse of scripture or if, you know, uh, they spend three minutes and 47 seconds on this song, you don't set up a fleece, but you're, you're sensitive enough that if something occurs that is a obvious sign from God, you don't miss it. That at least your ears heard the word and your eyes saw and you realize, you know what? I think God's trying to speak to me here. I think the Lord's trying to direct us here. So uh, we have to try to prove it out. We have to verify it. We have to confirm it. Um, One of the great benefits or blessings of coming to church, in my opinion, is to receive a word of confirmation. But in order to receive a confirmation, you have to have felt something already in your own heart. This is where your morning devotions come in. This is where praying before you come to church comes in. This is where praying in the week, studying your own Bible. Uh, You feel like God might be speaking something to you. You're not 100% sure. You think you've heard it. You think you know what God's saying. Uh, but, But you're still trying to prove it out. So if you come with something in your heart, something you're weighing, something you're pondering, something you feel like God's speaking to you, you, you are fertile ground to receive a confirmation from the pulpit. Or receive a a word of admonishment or caution or, you know, might completely overturn what you were thinking. You realize, oh, I don't think that was from God. I must have got myself all uh, sidewind and crooked. (laughs) Amen. And so uh, a big point for being in the house of God after we worship a while and praise God and return to the Lord thanksgiving for all that he's been doing for us and keeping us as we sit down to hear the word of the Lord through an anointed vessel to see what God is saying about and to uh, where I'm at in life. Um, first, I'm going to give you some basics. I'm gonna, we're going to start trying to you know, get into this will of God a little bit. And here's some basics. Um, first Thessalonians 518 in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So there's one thing we know is the will of God. It's broad, it's basic, but it'll work. In everything, give thanks. This is the will of God concerning you. Now notice the verse does not say for all things. It says in all things. That means, you know, you don't have to necessarily be thankful if you have a flat tire, but while you're changing it, you can be giving God some glory. (laughs) Amen. So while you're going through it, in all things, in every situation, Even in the bad situations, you're not enjoying, you're not liking it, you've been laid off from the job, you're behind on the rent, it's uncomfortable, but you can be still have a heart of thanksgiving and praise to God for what he has done and what you believe he's going to do. And on the fallback that all things work together for good, (laughs) at the end of the day, you can be thankful. It's the will of God that we be thankful. And I found out that it is impossible to be depressed and thankful at the same time. You're one or the other. And one displaces the other. If you allow yourself to get depressed, it's going to push your thanksgiving out. And if you allow yourself to have a heart of thanksgiving, it'll push the depression out. You can't have them both at the same time. Ecclesiastes 12 and 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And God shall bring into, into uh, every work into judgment and with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So fear God and keep his commandments. This is the will of God for your life and for mine. And remembering that every work is going to be brought into judgment. And God's going to judge our works, whether they be good, whether they be evil, whether they be wood, hay, and stubble that are going to be burned up in the fire. The way you're living your life right now, 
where you're spending your time, where you're spending your energy, where you're spending your money. You want to know what matters to you. You want to know what your affections are. You want to know what you really care about. Get your checkbook out and see where you spend your money. That's what really matters to you. Go through your monthly budget and look at how much money you spend on food, how much money you spend on entertainment, how much money you spend on clothes, how much money you gave to the kingdom of God. And when you can get all those numbers down, how much you spend on your housing, how much you spend on your vehicles. And when you get your numbers down, you can see where your affections are. Because the Bible said where your treasure is, there will your heart be. And the, the scriptural warning is that every work is going to come before the judgment of God. It's going to be wood, hay, and stubble, burn up in the fire, or it's going to be gold and silver that's going to come through. Um, and when the Bible says, fear God and keep his commandments, that's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, that pretty much covers the whole Bible, so there you go. It's the will of God, which means we're always looking to the word of the Lord to be what? A lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. Which means in every given circumstance, no matter how modern the problem may be, how complex it may be in, the, in this modern world we're living in, you can take the principle of that situation to the Word of God and you can seek and find somewhere that the Word of God will shed some light. There's a verse in there somewhere that has something to do with where you are and what you're dealing with. And we have to seek to find it. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst, they shall be filled. It's not always readily apparent. It's not always just right out there. I, I, I love you. I don't mean to be unkind. This is Bible teaching. This is, this is a little challenging. I'll be much more inspirational in the main service. But this is, this is instructional and challenging. But, uh, but, but I think sometimes we've just gotten a little lazy on God in this idea of seeking and finding his will. It takes some effort and takes some time. And, and, and some patience and waiting on the Lord and looking to see and, and getting that Bible out. And the old Thompson chain reference had references you could run. There's myriads of Bible apps you can put on your phone or your computer and start searching and looking and trying to find. And like a, like a treasure hunter, there's got to be something in here somewhere that has something to do with where we are. And I, 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 it's Bible class, but I'll prophesy. I prophesy to you right now. If you go searching and you go looking and you spend some time, the spirit of the Lord is going to direct you. And, and you're going to stumble on it. You're going to, you're going to ease into it. You know, just, you're going to find, you, you may be doing your Bible study and, and then lay that down. So oh, get me some coffee. And you know, you pick up another book you've been reading there, a devotional book or something and turn and boom, right there is your verse. But I'm telling you, I tell you in the fear of God, and I tell you with an anointing today that if you are looking to please God and you will sincerely pray and open your Bible with the purpose of Lord lead and direct me. I'm not promising it's going to come in the first two minutes or the first five minutes or even in the first prayer meeting or the first study session. But you know what, folks, this is important. And so you have to seek God. Um, let's, let's look at a few notable portions, a few uh, very important parts of getting down to the root of the will of God. Matthew 3, 9 through 11. Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And now also is the axe laid into the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now, the implications of this scripture are scary. We talk about the fear of God. It's scary. It's frightening. Because when you think about the axe being laid to the root of the tree, and if the tree does not bring forth good fruit, it's hewn down and it's cast into the fire. Well, all the implications are obvious. The tree is me. <laughs> I'm the tree. The requirement is fruit or fire. <laughs> Either bring forth fruit or you're hewn down and cast into the fire. And the fire, of course, is hell. Hellfire. It's eternal. It's being lost without God. The implications are clear. The implications are strong. The axe is laid to the root of the matter, to the tree. Bring forth fruit. It is clearly the will of God. Clearly the will of God. It is the perfect will of God. 
for each one of us to bring forth fruit. You've got to bring forth fruit. Somewhere, somehow, some way in your life, somehow, you have a requirement to bring forth fruit as a Christian. Luke 13 and 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree. That's me. I'm the tree. Planted in his vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereon and found none. He said to the dresser, I believe this would be the pastor. He says to the pastor of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? He answered and said, the pastor did, the dresser did, Lord, let it alone this year. I'll dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then thou shalt cut it down. This is fearful observation to me. This is, this is fearful. This is the fear of the Lord in my life. Because the, the observation is that the tree, that's me, is cumbering the ground. That means it's, it's a burden to the ground. It's hindering. One definition said it's hindering the ground. This tree is a burden to the ground. Now, now, now normally, it, it wouldn't be a problem that the tree is taking nutrients and water from the soil and soaking up the sunshine and getting all that. No, that wouldn't be a problem. That's normal. The tree needs that to live. You expect that the tree is going to draw in its root system from the ground. Remember, you're the tree. The ground would be the church, the spiritual condition, the atmosphere, the, the community of believers. It's natural, it's normal that you would come here and draw from this to strengthen you. That the prayers of the saints would pick you up. That this word of faith would encourage your soul. That when you're down, we pray for you, we anoint you with oil. That's all normal. It's all to be expected. It's all natural. But, but in this scenario, the, 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 the axe is laid, the, the dresser has come, he's, or the, 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 the master of the vineyard has come, and he said to the dresser, this tree is not bringing forth fruit, and it's hindering the ground. It's cumbering the ground. It's a burden to the situation. Why? Because it's not bringing forth any fruit. Wouldn't normally mind that it's drawing and that it's taking and that it's receiving and, and that it's soaking all this up if it was bearing fruit. But if all it's going to do is take and not give back, then you have this whole parable of the talents. We don't even want to go there. <laughs> that gets really bad. This guy buries his talent. See, it's getting bad up there. See where we are? We're right in the middle of the hellfire now. It's getting bad. This guy buries his talent and is labeled an unprofitable servant. You're not producing a profit. In other words, we're taking a loss on you. Remember, this is discipleship language. It's not saving language. This is discipleship language. In other words, it's taking more prayer, more energy, more time, and more effort to keep you saved, and you're not producing anything. What are you doing? What are you contributing? What fruit are you bearing? Of course, that whole story ends up with weeping and gnashing of teeth in outer darkness. Read it. That's the end of the story on the talent guy. He took his talent and buried it. He took his ability and did nothing with it. As a matter of fact, it was taken from him and given to the guy that was producing. The Lord's economy is totally different from what they're trying to do in the country right now. They want to take from the producers and give to the non-producers. They feel somehow it's not fair that this guy worked hard and got so much. But you know what the Lord's was? Oh, you don't want to work? You don't want to produce? You don't want to do anything with what I gave you? Take it back. This guy over here is working hard. He took his five and got ten. Let's give it to him. He, gave, he took the one with one talent and gave it to the guy that started out with five. Because the guy with five did something with his. Let's move along. Get, get that off the screen. Them flames are making people upset up there. Amen. Get serious. We're talking, about, we're talking about cutting down the tree and casting it into fire. Unprofitable servants being cast into outer darkness because of a failure to bring forth fruit. Okay, let's go back to Romans. Paul starts out in Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I beg you, brethren. Kind of helps you understand why the strong language. I beg you, brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God. We'd say it today, for God's sake, please. 
That's basically what he's saying. See, because he's coming from this whole understanding that if you don't bear fruit, you're cast out. If you don't, if you don't bring forth something, if you don't, if you don't fulfill your requirement, he says, I beg you by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to reasonable service, be transformed and not be conformed to this world and prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He's saying, I'm begging you to do this. It is extremely important. Serve God with your spiritual gifts. Let's keep, let's keep looking through this. It's Bible class. We'll just read it. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but think soberly. It's kind of what we're doing right here. We're thinking soberly. As God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. You have something to work with. You may be the one talented person, but you've got that. And that's all you're going to be required of. The Bible said to whom much is given, much is required. So to whom little is given, little is required. There is a requirement. If you have one single talent, that's all God's going to ask of you. It's not about you producing more than somebody else. It's just doing something with what you have. Every man has a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. All the members do not have the same purpose. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. I'm reading this from the New King James. Let us use them. If it's prophecy, let us prophesy. In the proportion to our faith, our ministry, let us use it in ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives, give with liberality. That means give a lot, <laughs> give generously. He who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. This is telling us to behave like a Christian. This is the way Christians act. This is what they do. If they have an ability, they use it for the kingdom of God. If they have a gift or a talent or a skill, they find a way to use that gift, talent or skill for the benefit of the kingdom of God. I long for the days of genuine, sincere volunteerism around the church where people just volunteered. Everybody wanted to help. And, you know, you can create a, almost a culture of, of contribution and not just in financial giving. I think it's great when a church has a, a revelation of giving and this church has that. You're great givers. You give liberally financially. I know just as one minister, myself and my family, we've been blessed by coming here among you because of your generosity, your love for the ministry, your giving to the kingdom of God. And that is a culture that you've been taught. And it's very good and it's blessed so many to have this culture of giving. But that needs to extend on beyond just our money and have a culture of giving of our abilities and our time and our talents to the kingdom of God. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. These are instructions about how you and I can prove out and do the will of God. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the need of the saints. Given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Even on Facebook with stars and hashtags means the same thing. You know, they taught me in preaching years ago. They said, you know, it's not always what you say, but it's what you make people think that's important. They said even one of the strategies of preaching is you don't have to say it all. As long as you paint the picture enough, the spirit of the Lord will cause the individual's eyes to be open, their ears to be open. And they'll get the full message even if you don't deliver the full message. You need to remember that when you're writing on Facebook. People get the message. We can read between the lines. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. This is powerful. I think it's a, this is a very valuable part of the will of God is learning to rejoice with those who rejoice, getting happy with people when they're blessed. I think we've fallen into a trap there too where somebody gets a blessing, especially if it's the blessing you wanted. Amen? 
my wife and I, we've been these many months. We Actually, January the 9th is when we find out we're going to have to move out of that house we've been living in for nine years in St. Louis. And so we've been displaced pretty much since January. And we've had several occasions to be with people, some pastors, some of our friends, that just got a new house or just remodeled their house. And we've walked through and done the grand tour, all the bedrooms and all the nice stuff and look at everything and talk about how nice and how wonderful everything is. And we're living in an RV. Yeah. Now, I don't know, it don't matter how much Holy Ghost you got. Yeah. Some stuff can just get on your nerves. <laughs> But the Bible says you want to walk according to the will of God. You want all things to work together for good. You want it all to start working out to bless you. Learn to rejoice with somebody else's blessing. Amen. And, and find, genuinely be happy for them. Man, I'm glad what God's doing. Because here's, here's, here's how I've learned to figure it out. You know what? If God can do this for you, if God can bless you like that. Amen. And when you see the people of God being blessed, it says that people are still getting blessed. Blessings do come from above. God is fulfilling his word. So that means if you've been blessed, I can be blessed. It's kind of like when it starts to rain. You know, you're walking along and one raindrop hits your hand. You go like this. One drop. You look up. Why? Because you know if there's one, there's probably some more coming. You know that just one or two drops tells me I better start looking for an umbrella because here in a little while there's going to be a bunch of drops. That's the attitude we should have when somebody in the church gets blessed. <laughs> if they got blessed over there, if he got a blessing over here, if he just got a job, if he just got a raise, if they were just able to get a new car, <laughs> might be more on the way where that came from. Amen. Can you say amen? Um, I don't know where I'm at here. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. I think that's important. Feel people's pain. Put your arm around somebody. Cry with them every once in a while. You know, uh, we, we get a little spoiled sometimes and somebody going through a hard time, especially if they stay in it too long and uh, they're on the other side of broken and they stay there on the other side a little longer than they ought to. <laughs> we give her, we don't even want to take their call. But you know, the Bible tells us to weep with those that weep. In other words, feel their pain. You know, but every time I talk to them, they just get me down. Well, just get down for a little while with them. And when you hang up, start thanking the Lord and praising God and take those burdens to the Lord. But we're supposed to help one another out a little bit. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things. Associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. <laughs> Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Much more your friend. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing you heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, be, be over, but overcome evil with good. These are all good practical applications of finding and doing and living the will of God. And I just kind of commented on a few. You could take every one of those sentences and think about how to apply that in a practical daily application of my life. And if you are living according to the will of God, all things will start working together for your good. You get the wind at your back. Things, momentum will happen. And all of this is just the beginning of possibilities. My brothers and sisters, we must produce fruit. Somehow, somewhere, some way, you've got to produce fruit. You've got to do something to contribute to the kingdom of God. The idea is to get involved, do something to help out, contribute in some kind of way. Don't stop seeking until you find a way or several ways in which you can be of service to the kingdom of God. Now, the church is a great place for volunteerism. We need everything here. Look at all this stuff. We need people in prayer ministry, music ministry, maintenance ministry, cleaning ministry, outreach ministry, evangelism, children's ministry, youth ministry, ladies' ministry, men's ministry, the sound and the media ministry, hospitality, ushers, greeters, administration. And this was just off the top of my head. I'm sure they got charts back here to tell you all kinds of stuff needs to be done in the church. Somewhere 
in some aspect of what this church is doing, you could find some kind of place. If you just have one little one job, I mean, I know all of our time is limited, but you got to decide what matters to you. And there's a requirement you produce fruit. You got to do something somewhere. Somewhere I've got to do something. I, I got to be praying. If, if, if you just visit the prayer room before church and help create the atmosphere. If you're a worshiper during the worship service, creating atmosphere, putting your hand on somebody's shoulder at the altar. You know what's happened to us, and, and I, I got to wrap up here. We're at the conclusion. But, but, but what's happened to us is we've let the American culture really define the way we do church. And we've become consumer minded. See, we live in a consumer culture. And so now they want us to treat church like Starbucks. Starbucks, our favorite coffee. When I want coffee, I'll go to Starbucks and buy coffee. Like them. They're great people. I'm in favor of them. Love their coffee. And when I want some, that's where I'll go get it. But I don't worry if Starbucks is going to be open or closed, if the dishwasher is going to be fixed. I just assume they're going to take care of their business. When I need coffee, I'll just go get some. And if I show up over there and they're closed for repairs, I'm frustrated. What's wrong with these people? Why don't they fix that stuff at nighttime when ain't nobody buying coffee? Right? I expect them to just take care of business. But somebody's got to work there. Somebody's got to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, show up over there, turn the lights on, mop the floors, clean everything up, put the coffee grinders out, get everything ready to go. Somebody's got to work there. Well, somebody's got to work here. Somebody had to get here early this morning. Somebody had to make sure everything's functioning, all the lights on, all the stuff's going, everything. Hey, you know, I spent this little 40-minute lesson, I spent several hours on this last night. Several hours putting all this together last night. Somebody's got to work before you get here for things to happen. We need people, we need laborers to work in the kingdom of God. The old song, Sister Marcelli, Jesus, use me. Oh, Lord, please don't refuse me. Surely there's a work that I can do, even though it's humble. See, now you know why I preach and not sing. Lord, help my will to crumble. Though the cost be great, I'll work for you. Amen. Amen. 11th hour laborers will be compensated abundantly. The promises of God are yea and amen. He will daily load you with benefits. We must embrace, in the final minutes here as we get ready to make our shift, we must embrace a mental and emotional shift in our mind from being spectators to being participators. That applies to worship services, and that applies to Monday through Saturday. Somehow I have to be a participator. And all this is very serious. But it's not that difficult. It's serious. But it's not difficult. Let me read you this last verse and then I'll close. Matthew 25. Watch. The king will say to those on the right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. This is the Lord welcoming faithful saints into the kingdom of God. Then the righteous answered and said, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or when were you thirsty and we gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or when were you naked and we clothed you? And when did we see you sick or in prison? And when did we come to you? And the king will answer and say, assuredly, I say, Insomuch as you did it to one of the least of these, brethren, you did it unto me. Would you stand with me right here? The Father that seeth in secret will reward thee openly. Every little kindness, every little gesture, every hand shaking a foyer out here. When you shake somebody's hand and you see their little discouraged, say, hey, the Lord's going to help you. It matters. It's fruit. It's contribution. It's just caring enough to give a kind word. It's caring enough to stay with somebody a few extra minutes in the altar. It's caring enough just to put your arm around them or pray with them, be moved with compassion, or pray for them privately at home just for a few minutes here and a few minutes there. Nobody knows what the king knows. And one day you're going to stand before him and hear him say, come on in. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. 
Would you lift your hands up to the Lord right here and let's pray. Let's pray the Lord to help us see and know his will and do his will. Lord, we're looking at some broad strokes. We're looking at some big issues. We want to be bearers of fruit. We want to work in the kingdom. We want to get involved. We're praying, Lord, that the unemployment rate of the church will go way down. That everybody get involved in, in the spiritual aspects. And Lord, even in working in the kingdom and taking on a role or a job or a function here at the church. But everybody contributing, everybody producing, everybody bearing some fruit. All of us bringing forth out of the power of the Holy Ghost in our heart. And Lord, I pray that as we give ourselves to the basics, give ourselves to these things, that we will enter into that blessed life, that abundant life where all things work together. Where things start working out, where you start blessing the work of our hands and our finance and our homes and our marriages as as we give ourselves and pour ourselves out for the kingdom, you pour back in the refreshing and the renewing and the power of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, I pray for every person here right now, every family, every marriage, every couple, every individual. I pray, Lord, as we're seeking you for your will over certain aspects of our lives, searching for the will of God to make decisions that, Lord, your light, the word of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord will be a lamp and a light that will give us that clear direction. And that everybody say in Jesus' name, God bless you. You can do whatever it is you do at this point.